like self-reflecting basically. What am I good at? What am I not good at? And what do I really want out of all of this? And it turned out it was just passive income and it was being in real estate as an investment class, but it wasn't being in the business of real estate. That wasn't really my strong suit. And that's what, not really what I wanted to do. I didn't want to manage tenants and, and take all my time to do this stuff. So I learned about syndications at that point. I sold all my single family homes from 2015 to 2016, including the house that I was living in and uh, rolled it all into passive uh, syndications where I was a limited partner. I could leverage other people's expertise and I could be completely hands off and take my time and focus on what I wanted to focus on full time. Welcome to Real Estate Deal Closers with Annette Tali, where we focus on the deals. Our guests are real estate closers who will share in detail the whole process from finding a deal to closing it, as well as strategies and tips to help you do the same. Here is your host, Annette Tali. Welcome to another episode of Deal Closers. I am your host, Annette Tali, and this is a special edition of Deal Closers. And my guest today is Travis Watts. Welcome, Travis. Hey, Annette. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited because today we're going to be talking about the FIRE movement and how it relates to real estate. So, you know, it's, I'm very excited about this. So let me tell you a little bit about Travis. He is a full-time passive investor. He has been investing in real estate since 2009 in multifamily, single family and vacation rentals. Travis is also the director of investor relations at Ashcroft Capital. Travis has invested in over 27 passive syndications between 14 different firms. Travis now dedicates his time to educating others in the world of investing and has made his mission to share passive investment strategies in order to help others achieve and maintain wealth in real estate. Awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So we're talking about fire movement and how does that relate? <laughs> yes. But, but before we get there, I want to know how did you get into real estate investing? Yeah, it's a good, interesting story. So <laughs> my dad, a long time ago, I was in high school and I was, um, uh, visiting him for the summer and he is a very frugal individual as is my mother and he was at a garage sale and he found a book he thought I would be interested in and it was Rich Dad's Prophecy. So a lot of people start their real estate journey with Rich Dad Poor Dad. You hear that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. The first book I had ever heard of or read was Rich Dad Prophecy and all it really taught me was we're going to have this huge economic meltdown at some point. And we're talking, this was probably 2006 or something like that. And it didn't pinpoint exactly when it just said, it's going to be crazy. And, and he leaves you hanging, you know? So it, it made me want to read more and, and educate myself more. And so I, I continued reading the rich dad book series and uh, that basically planted the seed in my mind that one day, as soon as I can, I want to get involved with real estate. And uh, so it was 2009 that I actually got started uh, where the prices had come down after the recession. They weren't quite bottomed at that point, but I could at least see what they were a couple of years ago. And that's where I got started. And you knew the prophecy. So you were <laughs> I knew the prophecy. I thought, hey, maybe that was it. It already popped. There was the bubble. Time to get in. It was just, it was kind of dumb luck, but uh, I at least had that, that seed planted. So I was ready to go. How old were you? Uh, so I was 20 uh, when I bought my first property and it was just, uh, I bought it actually as an owner occupied home and I house hacked it. So I just rented out the spare bedroom uh, to a college student <laughs> as I had just exited college. And uh, yeah, that, that just piqued my interest even more learning about passive income and you know, I was basically living for free at that point. Uh, so that, that, that led on to the fix and flips and vacation rentals and other, you know, active uh, single family strategies. Wow. And so how, how many uh, homes or how many investment properties did you have when you decided to go into multifamily? Yeah. So what happened was I, <laughs> I, I was working in oil field jobs. I was working 98 hours per week. I was working away from home. I ended up working in Saudi Arabia at the end of all of that. 
And so it was a very, very labor intensive, heavily focused, took all my time, right? And what I didn't realize was I had set out with this goal, not a very clearly defined goal, but a goal to have like say 50 or 100 single family homes one day, like as I get older. What I didn't realize is how much of a job that was really going to be. And so as you get to, you know, property number four, five, six, then you start thinking, wait a second, wait a second, you know, even with a property manager here, this is quite a bit going on. There's a lot of decisions to be made and it, you know, you got to find the properties and take time to all your weekends are gone, you know, uh, scouting out new investments, all that kind of stuff. So I had this huge breakthrough as around 2015 or so uh, where I just had to go back to the drawing board of, you know, realize like self-reflecting basically, what am I good at? What am I not good at? And what do I really want out of all of this? And it turned out it was just passive income and it was being in real estate as an investment class, but it wasn't being in the business of real estate. That wasn't really my strong suit. And that's what, not really what I wanted to do. I didn't want to manage tenants and, and take all my time to do this stuff. So I learned about syndications at that point. I sold all my single family homes from 2015 to 2016, including the house that I was living in and uh, rolled it all into passive uh, syndications where I was a limited partner. I could leverage other people's expertise and I could be completely hands off and take my time and focus on what I wanted to focus on full time. Awesome. That was the perfect timing too. You had it was, <laughs> you started at the right time and then you sold it at the right time. It was a, it was a good market. That was all out. All my single family was out in Colorado. And yeah, a lot of those years, specifically 2012, 13, 14, 15, those were solid years uh, to be in the, you know, fix and flip vacation rental, buy and hold, no matter what you touched in real estate, uh, that was a good time. So yeah. real estate deal closers, special edition. All right. So how did you find the fire movement? And, and then you tell me what exactly it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For anyone listening that, that doesn't know what we're talking about, uh, FIRE is a movement. It's an acronym, by the way. It stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. And, you know, you, you get some mixed reviews and mixed opinions out there. But uh, I think where it takes a lot of heat is, is on the, uh, the last part of the acronym, Retire Early. A lot of people, it's a, it's a foreign concept to think that you could actually retire in your 20s or in your 30s or just early at all because so much of the traditional path is set up to have people retire in their 60s and in their 70s, right? That's when social security is there for you. That's when you can start touching your IRAs and pulling out money there. So a lot of folks are shoving money, you know, that direction through the traditional vehicles for their 60s and 70s. So the FIRE movement is this, um, it's not a huge movement, by the way. I don't know percentage-wise of, of the U.S. or the world. It's not much. It's definitely under 1%. Um, and it's this idea that... <clears throat> You're, you're going to start as early as possible and you're, you're going to make as much money as you possibly can with whatever your highest and best means are. For some people, that's a professional career, like a doctor, dentist, whatever it may be. Uh, for others, like myself, it was the oil field. It was just a high paying job. That's all it was at the end of the day, right? It didn't take any background or credentials. It's just if you're willing to work your butt off and be away from home, you get compensated for it. So, so here's, it's kind of a three-step process. You make as much money as you can for a short amount of time. That's kind of the caveat. This isn't just work until you burn out or kill yourself. It's just a short amount of time. For me, that was like a five-year stint. Number two, live below your means, um, you know, as extreme as possible. So for me, that involved house hacking and, and having roommates and all that kind of stuff and, and not taking vacations for a while, not spending on stuff, not buying new cars, not taking on debt, all that kind of uh, stuff. And then number three, it's you're, you're taking the margin of difference between what you're earning and what you're spending on your lifestyle and you're investing that amount into investments. Where I kind of differ or have a different opinion on the fire movement is that I parked all my capital into real estate specific because of passive income. That's kind of my whole life philosophy is, is time freedom and what passive income can really mean to people. Uh, a lot of people in the fire movement will park 
their capital into like an index fund, like a, something that tracks the S and P 500 stock index, you know? And uh, so, so you're doing all this for, uh, you know, let's say five years or 10 years. It's different for everybody based on your savings rate. And then you essentially have enough uh, of investments or cash flow to retire early. Now you're going to start pulling from those investments and living on it. And so when you have more passive income, then you have living expenses. That's where financial freedom or financial independence comes into play. That's how it works. So I did it through the real estate path. I didn't know this movement existed just by the way, up until just a couple of years ago. But I, I bring it up on this podcast because I really have always followed this strategy without even knowing this was a thing. I didn't know there was other people doing this also. I just was raised by a couple uh, frugal parents and just kind of did it by default, I guess. Wow. So you started investing in 2005, in nine, right? Mm -hmm. And then right. you find the movement, you said? I'm sorry, what was that? When did you find this movement? Yeah, I only heard about this movement maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago. You were already doing it all, even before. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 well before. So now in, in full transparency, there were folks promoting this idea through books and other mediums back as far as the 80s, but they didn't call it the fire movement. It was just like frugal living or you know, you would hear different terms and, and things like that. So it's really come together as this idea that, you know, as, as a lot of people find themselves unhappy in the corporate world and climbing the corporate ladder, they think, you know, I don't want to do this for 50 years, you know, or something like that. I, I wouldn't mind doing it for 10 years or 15 maybe, but then I, I want to be done. And so this is kind of a way and a strategy to follow uh, where you can potentially have that kind of result and outcome. Wow. So what's the idea once you reach the financial independence so what do you do? <laughs> exactly. So that's kind of the point behind it. A lot of people think all this stuff's about money, you know, investing in real estate and, and cash flow and, and it's all money, 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 money. It's not about money though, to me anyway. It's about your time. So what happened for me was this. I was working the oil field. I did not like that career. I did not see a long-term future in it. In addition to the fact that that industry, oil and gas is a very boom and bust industry. So even if I did love it, it'd be very hard to make a 50 year career out of it, uh, even having that um, ambition. So what, it, what I did is, and I, I don't know how this came up or, or why, but I, one day I was just, I opened up an Excel sheet and I started listing out all of my homes and all of my assets and my brokerage account and my bank accounts and the house I lived in, all my equity. And I thought, you know, what if I sold everything, including the house I was in, and I paid all the taxes and I paid the realtor commissions and I did all that. What would I be left over with? How much money? You know, basically I was calculating my net worth, right? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, okay, if I took my net worth in, in its entirety and I started putting that into passive syndications, 25K here, 50K there, 50K there, and I spread that across and I had just a conservative cash flow amount that I could count on more or less in the ups and downs of the market. What, what would that mean? Well, to me, it meant I could leave that job, number one, which was most important to me. I really wanted out of that career path. And so then it gave me the freedom and the flexibility to pursue work that I actually wanted to do. That, I, that it was creative work. It was stuff that I could self-develop out of. So the first thing I did is I went to go work for a brokerage firm to learn stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And I thought, man, if I could master the paper asset world plus real estate, I'd be you know, financial guru or something like that. I don't know what I was thinking, but it was fun. And, uh, but ultimately wasn't what I wanted to do either long-term. I just, I didn't like the way that it worked from the inside looking out and uh, you know, what you can and can't help people with really. Um, I, I, you know, I really want to be more of like a fiduciary where I could just tell people just anything and everything that I thought would be helpful. So uh, I left that to go work for a couple different syndication groups in the multifamily space to learn underwriting acquisition, you know, investor relations, all that kind of stuff, just to know how that business model worked. And that's what led me to Ashcroft Capital, working with Joe Fairless as part of their team as I thought, what better thing could I do with my time right now than be able to travel around, meet with people, network, self-develop, self-educate, and share 
what types of things have really helped me and, and impacted my life and my wife's life and my family's life and, and just share how that works and what that is. And so that, that's what I do. And that's what I choose to do with my time, at least right now. So, you know, ask me in 10 years. I don't know. <laughs> well, you have the flexibility of choosing what, what else you want right. to do, right? right? At that point, you're going to be able to, um, yeah. to choose. I think that the fear is when like people don't have any other aspirations, you know, and they don't know what else they could be doing later that they get, they, they get, they get worried about it because somebody that knows what they want to do, they are going to be looking for that. Exactly. So it, it's, you know, for everybody, like the why is different, right? For some people, it's, I, I wish I were a, a part-time worker, not a full-time worker. I wish I could travel the world, but I can't. Or, you know, I, I wish I could be more charitable or spend more time volunteering at, at my church or, you know, the list goes on and on. Everybody has their, their whys. Um, but, you know, for, for my wife and I, it had a lot to do with travel. Uh, we absolutely love traveling. We travel the world. And so not right now because of COVID, but <laughs> that's kind of a downer. But uh, besides that, um, yeah, that, that, was, that had a lot to do with why we chose a, a passive path um, to wealth. That is awesome. So what, like you were kind of doing it already, like you mentioned, but what changed once you found this uh, movement? What, what changed? Yeah. There's a lot of, clarity uh, it was first of all it was inspirational and very cool to realize that you know there's thousands and thousands of people and they just in, in 2019 they just made a really good documentary it's called playing with fire came out i think in the fall it, that can do you know justice to, to this whole movement as far as clarifying and giving you some visuals and some practical you know takeaways and, and stuff like that and so it, it follows a, a family doing this as an experiment from san diego in a very high you know uh, cost of living area and they move and they reevaluate what's important in life and i think the fire movement has a lot to do with that too as so many people get caught up in the, the the keeping up with the Joneses, you know, the more money you make, it's well, now I need a new car. Now I need two cars. Now I need an exotic sports car. Now I need a bigger house. I've got to take more elaborate vacations. I've got to, and, and, and you're never really getting ahead, you know, financially. And so I think a lot in the fire movement has to do with just self reflection to what's actually bringing you happiness and satisfaction. And you might find that a lot of things are free or very cheap, you know, it might just be, you know, a, a particular uh, drink you like, or, or ice cream, or, you know, spending time with your kids, or whatever it is. And so it's kind of doubling down on the things that make you most fulfilled, and then being able to eliminate, you know, let go of ego and, and eliminate the things that are kind of distractions to your long term success. Wow, you just made me realize, my husband and I, we took a six month uh, trip around Asia and New Zealand and Australia. And it was kind of like the same thing. We had to basically pack for six months in one backpack, you know, yeah. Yeah. we travel and it was an amazing trip. We are so glad that he, my husband is so glad I convinced him because he was totally against it at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but we had a blast as a couple. We, you know, we, were together for six months, 24 seven. So we learned <laughs> everything about each other. It was amazing. But when we came back, you know, it made us realize how little you really need. Exactly. You know, you can live with so much less than what we normally do. You know, like yeah. we came back and we rented an apartment of a fr from a friend and we had an inflatable bed. We had like a portable table. <laughs> Yeah. And, the and you know we live like that for like six months and that allows us to save a lot of money to you know get back into our lives and you know so you know little by little you kind of forget it right like oh do i need mm -hmm. this maybe not like when we can we're like do we need this no we don't need it we're not gonna buy it and then little by little you forget and you get back into your spending but yeah that made us realize that you don't need so much. Like you can live with a lot less. That perspective is so invaluable. And that's so much of why we love travel. We, we were out in, in Thailand. That's where my wife and I took our honeymoon. And just to, to realize 
that a lot of families there are making, you know, five or $10 a day total, and they're supporting three kids, and they're completely happy and fulfilled. And then, as you said, you come back to the States, and it's, you know, $10 for a hamburger at the airport, and then <laughs> off you go in your $50 Uber ride, you know, and, and you just, you just realize, yeah, that, that you could have a lot less, like you said, but it's not about having less, and it's not about you know, minimalism, even though, you know, we've embraced a lot of that too, definitely done the air mattress stuff as well and downsize where we live to a lot less square footage. But it's really about like, like we talked about re reflecting on and, and taking the time to understand what's really adding value to you. And if it is, by the way, a sports car, and that's real and that's your passion. And, and ever since a kid, you know, you, you've just idolized cars and that's just everything. You, then buy the cars, you know, spend the money on the cars, but then maybe don't spend the money on whatever else, you know, taking a $5,000 cruise if you don't like taking vacations. <laughs> you know, it's just about identifying where to, where to place your money and uh, maximizing the results in your fulfillment. Awesome. All right. So, so how do you start with this? You said there are three steps, right? So you, you make as much as you want, to, as much as you can, and then mm -hmm. you below your means, and then you get um, the difference and, to invest. And put the difference into investments, right? Earn as much as you can, live on as little as you can, and then invest the difference, basically. And, and just keeping in mind that this is a relatively short term process in your life. This isn't a way to live till the day you die where you just die with a bunch of money and stuff. It's just, it, for me, it was, it was kind of this five, six year type of thing where I really went at it real hard. Uh, for others, it could be 10 years. It depends on a lot of things, but um, you know, I had the ability to really hustle <laughs> and grind it out. And, uh, and I was willing to do that, you know, and I, I recognize that not everybody is, but um, and, and it's, it's, it's also a lot about avoiding the traps that so many of us fall into from taking on consumer debt and, and taking on these you know, huge student debt. I mean, that's an obvious crisis that's happening right now in, in the U.S. And so, you know, it, it's just as early as you can, it's education. And then it's just trying to make the best moves that you can as you progress through it. But at the end of the day, it's just being wise with your money, you know, having a budget and sticking to it. I mean, at the end of the day, 101. <laughs> yeah, That's how so, you can start. And, and that is, uh, for a lot of people, it's hard to do, just creating a yeah. budget and following it. It is. It can be, you know, but everything's a choice. And so to me, I'd rather put in, you know, a real tough five years and then, you know, live like a lot of people can't, you know, for 30, 40 years, you know, and, uh, and it doesn't have to be a, uh, an elaborate thing, but, um, that's just a choice, you know, but a lot of people will, will just choose to grind it out too and, you know, forever. So it's all options. This is just one way to look at it. It does give you the options, right? You can, you get to choose after you work really hard for a certain time, you know, then you get to choose what you want to do. So it, it's about choices, you know, it gives you choices too. It's about your time too. I mean, at the end of the day, I always go back to that, you know, why passive income and why real estate and why frugality and why retire early and why it's, it's all about your time. It's just all about time. That's the one thing that, you know, you, you can't get it back. You know, it's the one resource that a lot of people would probably agree is the most important resource that, that we all have. Absolutely. Expert tips. All right. So now you wanted to give me three tips on personal development. Sure. Uh, yeah. A huge advocate of, you know, and follower of people like Tony Robbins. And I've read so many books on just self-development and think and grow rich and all that kind of stuff. You know, some of it can be kind of cheesy, but, but I love it. So uh, the first thing I would give is just starting with a goal in mind. And I'll share a real quick story on that. When I started in real estate, I didn't necessarily have a goal in mind. I just thought, yeah, I want to get in. I just want to make money, you know, but that wasn't a good goal. You know, how much money for how long, for what reason, what are you going to do if you got it? You know, I didn't have any of that stuff to find. And so what, what happened was 
like, like I said, I spent five years just sort of bouncing all over the place, a fix and flip here and a buy and hold and a vacation rental and a, and a few stocks and a few, you know, I didn't know what I was doing or why. And had I just had a focus, like I want $10,000 per month cash flow. And if I have that, I will travel the world with it. I will retire early. I will give back this much. I will, it, that, that just defining that, that goal would have made, a huge impact <laughs> in those five years. I probably could have turned the five years at least into three and got the same results easily. Right. How many units did you have when you decided to, to go passive? Yeah, it was, it was always rotating. Uh, and I was doing a lot of like owner occupied stuff too, where I'd buy a distressed house, live in it a couple of years, fix it up, sell it for tax free gains, legally, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I seven or something like that, you know, at any given time. Okay, awesome. All right. Second tip. Uh, just become a learning machine. <laughs> that sounds kind of crazy, but I'm such an advocate for self education. I can't tell you and your listeners how much of an impact it's had just to read books in general, not one a year, not two a year, like one a month, right? Minimum. In 2015, when I had this huge breakthrough, I made a goal, uh, January 1st, I was going to read 52 books in one year. So one book per week. And I did it. And it made a huge impact. I mean, it just, it opened my mind in such a huge way. That's a little intense, by the way. I don't recommend people necessarily do that. But, <laughs> uh, but it was so much information crammed in at once. I couldn't obtain all of that. But, but it still helped tremendously. And I listen to podcasts all the time. And I watch documentaries, like I mentioned, the playing with fire all the time. And there's been books like Tom Wheelwright's book, Tax-Free Wealth, that's saved me tens of thousands of dollars just off that one book I paid $15 for. So tremendous value in, in reading and, and self-education. So become a learning machine, number two. Absolutely. And, you know, not right now because we're at home, but driving, your driving time can be listening to books, listening to yep. podcasts. That's what I normally do because I, you know, I don't like sitting and reading. I just love, you know, listening. So that's another way if you say you don't have time or you don't like reading, sitting down, then you can do audiobooks, podcasts and all that. It, you could think of it this way. I, I, I don't know if this is the exact stat, but I think it's somewhere like the average American reads one book per year. So if you could do an audio book, like you said, on your commutes to, to and from work, and you could do one per month, that's 12 per year, you're going to get 12x the results of the average person. So just look at it that way. If you want to be more than 10x beyond what most people are doing, you're not having to take any additional time out of your life. You're just maximizing what time you already have. And instead of staring at the road, you're getting educated simultaneously. Love it. Absolutely. And if you love it, then you can buy the hard copy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yep. All right, third tip. Uh, third tip is just, you know, just in general, get your finances under control. You know, the, the way I see it, there, there's kind of two sides to the coin. You know, there's the understanding money and keeping it and being intelligent with it, right? So kind of the budgeting side of things. Then there's the investing side. It's how to make money and how to start businesses and what to invest in and cash flow and equity and all that kind of stuff. So whether it means just literally creating an Excel sheet budget for yourself, how much do I spend on you know, food expenses and random miscellaneous and, and toothpaste and, <laughs> you know, but really to realize that you hear it all the time, the, the latte factor, you know, people spending $5 a day on a latte and what that adds up to. And, and if you invested it instead, I mean, all those, you know, cheesy examples, but it's true in that it all does add up. And, and to use an extreme example is like, um, Think about like a Mike Tyson who made over $300 million in his career and lost it all because he didn't know the side of the coin. He didn't even, he didn't clearly didn't have a budget, but uh, you know, didn't know what he was doing with money. So don't be that person. <laughs> Absolutely. A budget is so important. And you know, I used to do my budget, you know, and then update it every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because I haven't updated last year, but Actually, it's on my to-do list for this year because I haven't done it in a while. And, you know, in a year, things change, you know, and you don't realize, I think, being home so much, 
I realized how much the credit card, you know, I pay it monthly. So I don't, I realized how much sl smaller it is this month. So I'm like, you know, I need to look at what were those expenses that I am not doing anymore? Well, eating out probably is one of them, uh, a big one, but you know, you can save a lot of money if you do a budget and you just set an, an amount, you know, for certain things like eating out this much and going out mm -hmm. this much. Exactly. So that's a, that's a huge one, a huge variable. Obviously there's some things you can't cut from your budget, you know, like what, it, like your health insurance is what it is. Right. I and mean, it's not like you're going to cut it in half. So, but then there's things like that, food expenditures, you know, the latte factor or whatever, uh, you know, a lot of people like their, you know, consumer goods. But again, is it, you got to remember, like, why are you buying that stuff? Does, is it really bringing you a ton of fulfillment or is there a different way you could make the same purchases, right? So you, you may love shoes, but do you have to go pay $200 for a pair of shoes every single month because you need the latest and greatest? Or could you buy the same pair pre-owned maybe, you know, there's all these different sites now, Poshmark and Mercari and eBay, and maybe you could find them for 30 bucks, you know? So it doesn't mean stop doing the things that you love. It's just maybe there's a, a better approach to it. Absolutely. So uh, Travis, where can people find you if they want to get in contact with you? Yeah, email's usually the best. So Travis at ashcroftcapital.com. Uh, I'm also on uh, Bigger Pockets, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, Passive Investor Tips is my Instagram uh, name there. So yeah, reach out. I, I talk with people all week long about everything in investing and passive income and house hacking and syndication. So uh, definitely reach out. I just I'm a networker, so I love to hear everybody's uh, various stories, learn from them as much as I like to share, uh, you know, resources and, and my knowledge. Awesome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Annette. Appreciate it. This was Real Estate Deal Closers with Annette Talee, brought to you by Talee Investments. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Our goal is to provide amazing value on your real estate journey. Connect online at www.taleeinvestments.com where you can find this episode and more. Did you like this episode? Subscribe, like, and share.